Hello Physics 11 students. Today we're here doing special relativity. It's special and it's relative. <laughs> the idea of, I really want to do this lesson, uh, I don't, I want you just to, to be amazed by special relativity. Um, there are calculations and so on that we could be doing and I'm going to go through one of the calculations. I'm going to show you how this calculation comes about through you know, high school level mathematics and uh, hopefully instill in you some of the, the wonder of what uh, special relativity is. Uh, the idea of relativity, special relativity, goes back to Albert Einstein. And uh, Einstein. And in 1905, I can't spell 1905, there we go. In 1905, he wrote five papers published five papers that dealt with a whole bunch of different topics in, in varied directions. And the idea that he could come up with these five papers uh, really marked really his, his brilliance and his genius and so on. Um, and one of these was dealing with uh, what we call special relativity. Now, the idea of relativity I'm going to try to explain that and then so we can take a look at uh, the difference or the, the change that Einstein gave to us. But what you see, what you observe, depends on where you are. And uh, one way to look at this is, you know, consider you're sitting in a car. And you're sitting in the car, here's you sitting in the car, da-da-da-da-da. And you've got a ball. And you're taking that ball and can we do this? No, <laughs> the whole thing goes up. So you got the ball and you toss in the ball and the ball goes up and the ball comes down. The ball goes up and the ball comes down. And so what you see is that motion of the ball going up and coming back down again. And it's going straight up and down. And you are at rest with the ball, and so what you see is the ball is going straight up and down. Now, if you had somebody on the outside, and you were in the car, but the car was not moving, then they would see exactly the same thing. The ball's going up, the ball's going down, ball's going up, the ball's going down, and that's what they observe because you're not moving. But let's now put you into what we would call a moving frame of reference, because now you're in the car, you've got the ball, and to you the ball's going up and the ball's going down, but here we have the person here. And so as you're traveling along, well, the ball's going to go up, but you're traveling this way, it goes to the very top, and then it's going to be coming down till you, when you catch it over here. To you, the ball's gone up, the ball's going down, but to this person here, they're seeing this path that the ball is taking. What you observe, what you observe depends on, or is relative to, where you observe from. From where. We'll get this set up. So, and that's really what is meaning by the idea of relativity. Motion and observations are relative to how you observe it. Let's consider another situation. We've got uh, a truck. And on the back of the truck, we've got uh, a pitcher. And the pitcher is, he's got a ball and he's throwing the ball. And he can throw the ball at 90 kilometers per hour. Well, over here, we've got the catcher. Better put a mask on him. Right. <laughs> so when he catches the ball, so he throws it at 90 kilometers per hour. To him, the ball is traveling at 90 kilometers per hour. If the truck's not moving, then he sees the ball hitting him at 90 kilometers per hour. They are at rest with each other, and so the motion is, is that way. But let's say the truck takes off at, say, 50 kilometers per hour. The pitcher 
get rid of that. The pitcher is still pitching it at 90 kilometers per hour. To the pitcher, he sees the ball traveling at 90 kilometers per hour. But now the truck is moving this direction at 50. So we would have 90 minus 50. And so this fellow here who's, at, who's watching this guy take off, he's going to see it at 40 kilometers per hour. Hey, can't you pitch it? That was like nothing. So then, you know, the pitcher turns around and says, taps on the, the truck and says, all right, let's throw it in reverse. And so suddenly, instead of going 50 kilometers this way, he's going 50 kilometers this way. And so then when he throws the ball, he throws it at 90. He sees it at 90. He's at rest with the ball as he's throwing it. But now for the catcher, well, that's going to be 90 plus 50. Shoot, now that's 150. 140 kilometers per hour, and he's glad he's got his mask on. So here we see motion is relative. We can say additive. That the velocity vector of the ball and the velocity vector of the, the frame of reference of the truck add together to what we, this fellow here sees. That's sort of the idea of relativity. But we come to light. Light has a velocity. It used to be that they didn't actually think that light had a velocity. Light travels so quickly that uh, they really thought it was infinitely fast, I guess. Uh, and But then as they were able to develop technologies, they were able to measure the, the speed of light. And when they were able to measure the speed of light, and they would do this with uh, mirrors on tops of mountains, with light traveling uh, at certain, well, certain distances, and uh, by knowing the times of spinning mirrors, they could measure the velocity of light. Uh, if you're really interested, you could take a look at how can you measure the velocity of light, and you might see some references to some of the experiments that they did. Anyways, light travels very fast. In fact, it travels at 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Not infinitely fast, but very fast. And um, the interesting thing, though, is that we can talk about the speed of light and give it this value. But when we talk about the speed of light, when we talk about C, it's not about the speed of light. It's not the speed. In fact, the value for C, this 3 times 10 to the 8th, is a constant that comes out of pure science, pure thought. As scientists were taking a look at various phenomena in terms of electromagnetic waves and different things like this, they were coming up with a value for the speed of these things. Now, to be honest, I'm not saying that I can even begin to understand the work and so on that they were doing. It's beyond my education. But I do know that they were coming up with values, and they would come up with a value for something called the speed of light that had a value of 3 times 10 to the 8th, not varying. C does not change. What do I mean doesn't change? Well, coming back to here, if we took a look at the speed of the baseball, the speed of the baseball for the catcher was depending on what the relative motion of the truck was that the pitcher was on. The velocities are additive, the velocities were not. So when we're dealing with the speed of light, let's say we had on the back of the truck, <laughs> what a terrible truck, uh, we had a flashlight that was shooting out speed light at 3 times 10 to the 8th. Well, if you took a look at the velocity, and added that on, they wouldn't add. The speed of light is always the same. It's the same in every frame of reference. You can't go anywhere in the universe and measure the speed of light to be anything other than 3 times 10 to the 8th. All right, so let's set up an experiment. Let's do this in space. So we're going to set up this spacecraft, and uh, 
we're going to have a spaceman. I always put him into us. And he's sitting in here. I don't know. He's got a laser, he's got a mirror, and he's got a detector. And let's change colors. And so the, the laser is going to send out a light. It's going to hit the mirror, and it's going to reflect back down here. And from that, so we know the distance. We'll know the time. And if we take distance divided by time, we get our velocity, which, because this is light, will be equal to c, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now you can see that this makes some sense, that you know, whether we actually have the equipment to do this, but we can understand that we could do this. We could set up a source, the light would bounce off a mirror, picked up by a detector, we could measure the length of time, know the distance, we could calculate the speed. But then this, the story goes, all right, so let's put a person down on Earth and let's give him a pair of binoculars so he can watch what's happening in the spacecraft. I'm going to draw the spacecraft in three different locations. So starting here, when we're traveling in this direction, here, and then here, okay? Just so we can see. So we've got the spaceman, He's lying it down the floor here. Maybe all I can draw the spaceman is his helmet. Uh, okay, he's there. And so we've got the sender, we've got the detector, the sender, the detector, sender, the detector. And we've got the mirror here, the mirror here, and the mirror here. So we know that uh, the light's going to go up, hit the mirror, and come back down. This is what the astronaut sees. What the observer on Earth sees, well, he sees the light starts here, hits the mirror here, and hits the detector here, which means that he's seeing the light, and this is like, remember the ball being thrown up in the car? You know, we said the ball, to the person in the car, the ball's going up and down, but the person standing beside the car watching the car go past sees the ball go up and come back down again. It's relative to where you observe it. So the person on the Earth, on the planet, watching the spacecraft go by, sees the lights take off here, hit the mirror here, and hit the detector here. And so if we're talking about distances, this is the distance. And so the time that this guy measures in that distance, well, that has to be equal to C, our 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So this gets kind of weird because this guy in here measuring the distance, you got the distance across the spacecraft, measures that distance and the time comes up with 3 times 10 to the 8th. Here we can see much longer distance, again, 3 times 10 to the 8th. Let's take a look at how we can do this. What I'm going to do is that, uh, I'm going to draw, well, coming back to here, recognize that what we have here is a right triangle, okay? Here we have a horizontal, here we have the hypotenuse, and here we have the vertical. I'm just going to redraw that, and let's take a look at what we information we can get from this. So these are physical distances. The spacecraft is going this way at B. So the, this distance here is going to be, because distance is equal to velocity times time, let's just state that. So this horizontal distance is going to be velocity times the time, and that's the person who's watching the spacecraft go by. But the light traveled this distance here. The speed of light is c. And what Einstein said is the speed of light is going to be the same everywhere. So this distance here has to be the speed of light times the time that he measured. These two t's are the same. Here we have c, here we have the velocity of the spacecraft. This line here, though, represents the person who is at rest. 
Now, we said that he measures the speed of light to be also c, 3 times 10 to the 8. These two c's have to be the same. That's what, that is the confounding point of special relativity. The speed of light is the same in every frame of reference. And so Einstein's insight was that time changes. Speed of velocity, the velocity of light can't change. So for this diagram to work out, time has to change. So we use this symbol T naught, and this is what we would call the rest time. This is the clock that is at measured, measuring time, who is at rest of the event. In this case, the spaceman watches the light go bounce off the ceiling, come back down again. That's his time. He is at rest of the experiment. This fellow here is watching the experiment fly by, so he's measuring our time t. Now, we're going to do some... So, time changes. Time depends upon where you observe. Let me just write that again. Time changes. Does time change to you? Only when you're sitting in science class, because you know when you come to science class, you know, like time flashes by. Time is so quick in science class. And when you go to English or math, time just drags on and on and on and on. It's really quite amazing how that works. <laughs> Yeah, not really. That's not what we're talking about, but time actually does change depending on how you are moving. In fact, time slows the faster you move. Spacecraft goes out into space, time slows down. There's called the twin paradox, and maybe we'll talk about it, maybe we won't. But anyways, let's go back and we've, we've got this diagram here. This was CT, this was VT, and this was CT naught. Now, this is a right triangle, so we can use Pythagoras. And so we can say CT squared is equal to VT all squared plus CT naught all squared. So let's just do the algebra and see what we can come up with. C squared, T squared, V squared, T squared, C squared, T naught squared. So we've just taken the squares through. We're going to move this term to the other side. So we're going to get C squared, T squared, minus V squared, T squared is equal to C squared, T naught squared. So let's go and we'll divide through by c squared. Because then when we do that, c squared divided by c squared is just 1. So we get t squared minus v squared over c squared t squared is equal to t naught squared. Okay, we can factor out this t squared. So we get a t squared onto 1 minus v squared over c squared is equal to t naught squared. Oh, too much gone by. There we go. Let's bring this over to the other side. So we get t squared is equal to t naught squared over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Oh, 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 sorry, not quite. Spoke too soon. Try that again. 1 minus v squared over c squared. And so now we take the square root of everything. So square root here, square root here, square root here. And we get t is equal to t naught over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And if we were doing this in a regular situation, this would be one of the equations that we would use in special relativity, and we'll do an uh, a question of this, an example of this uh, later on. 
But let's take a look what this means. So we have velocity, we have the speed of light, one minus. Let's say our velocity is equal to zero. If our velocity is equal to zero, we have zero on top divided by c squared. So zero divided by c squared is equal to zero. We have one minus zero is equal to one. The square root of one is equal to one. And so we get t is equal to t naught. So when the velocity is not, when we have no velocity, we see no changes in time. There is no relativistic changes in time. But let's say v is basically the speed of light. If v is the speed of light, then we have c squared over c squared, that's equal to one. So we have one minus one is zero, the square root of zero being zero, and then we have t naught divided by zero. Well, t then is undefined. Okay, there we go, uh, undefined. And in fact, what happens is that as v approaches c, as it gets closer and closer to c, this becomes, uh, well, this, this side becomes larger and larger and larger, uh, going towards infinite. So like time slows down, time expands, dilates. That's what's happening in here. So these are the two extents for this. So let's do a question. So uh, you're in a spacecraft or you're observing something that is traveling at 90% the speed of light. And we would write that as 0 0.9 C. That's how fast it's traveling. Time is equal to one hour. So the person who is observing the spacecraft sees one hour go by. And because this thing is traveling so quickly, they want to know, well, how did time pass for the spacecraft that was speeding by? They want to know what the, this rest of time was. Right, so we're going to set up our equation. T is equal to T naught over the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. And you're going to see why we express the velocity as a factor or a fraction of C just because it makes our calculations much easier. So if we substitute in our values, uh, all right. Mm. Okay, yeah, we'll do it this way. It's not the way I did it in my notes, that's all. So this is equal to one, and we have t naught is what we're trying to find, and then we have the square root of one minus 0 0.9 c squared over c squared. And as we go through this, 0.9 squared is 0.81. And so we get uh, t naught is equal to the square root of 1 minus 0.81 c squared over c squared. And so those cancel out. And so we're left with 1 is equal to t naught over the square root of 1 minus, uh, so if we go point. So doing the calculation and then coming back in, that's equal to 0 0.19. And so that's equal to t naught over 0.436. And so we multiply. So t naught is equal to 0.436 hours. So what appears to be on the spacecraft is 0.436 hours. We're measuring that as one hour. Time has slowed down in the frame of reference. Now we might say, like, can this really be true? <laughs> like, does time really change? And the answer is yes. Uh, in particle accelerators, when you take protons and neutrons and things like that and speed them up to uh, velocities that are very close to the, the speed of light, we can see that time changes. Uh, we have uh, particles coming from space, and uh, they don't exist for very long. They, they have half-lives that are very, very small. But because they're traveling so fast, time for the particles actually slows down, and so we observe them to be or, uh, 
living for a longer period of time and so they can actually make it through our atmosphere and so on. Uh, they sent clocks onto aircraft just going around the world and uh, when the planes got back after going all the way around the world with these highly specialized clocks on there they compared the clock to a clock that had remained behind and the, there was a difference in time and the difference in time corresponded to the calculations based upon uh, <laughs> the special relativity. Now there are some other effects we're not going to go through and do calculations, but I just want to give you uh, some look at that. As things speed up, mass increases. And so we can say mass, the relativistic mass, is equal to the rest mass, and it comes out to be 1 minus v squared over c squared. Same relationship. Length contracts. distances get smaller, and that goes L is equal to L naught square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. So this square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared uh, is, is a common factor of these things. It accounts for velocities as they approach the speed of light. So there is this consistency. I can't derive these ones the way I can, the, the T, the time, uh, but yeah, these correspond as well. Something that sort of came out of his special relativity is the very famous E equals mc squared. This was in a different paper in 1905 than special relativity, but it came about of this. And really, like, c is just a number, so we can say E is equal to m. E is energy. m is mass. Energy is equal to mass. Hi. <laughs> I got people popping in as my virtual lesson here. Energy is equal to mass. Energy and mass are the same thing. Now, the result of this was the whole idea of the atomic bomb. The whole idea is that you could take a mass of for these things and create this very, very huge explosive bomb because the energy in terms of being proportional to mass, is on the order of the speed of light squared. The speed of light is a large number. When you square it, it only gets bigger. So you take a little bit of mass, times it by this, we get a whole lot of energy coming out. And this is one of the results of this. So our whole nuclear age, as it were. All right, so we've got this idea. Mass increases, length contracts, mass and energy are the same thing. We're almost done. That was special relativity. Uh, I can't even spell relativity. Now, the, the thing about this was that these frame of references, the acceleration was equal to zero, not accelerating. And it became fairly simple. In, order to, you know, in high school math, we could calculate are, you know, the time dilation for special relativity. It took about 30 years because he knew that there had to be uh, what became known as general relativity. And, uh, I mean, the idea of special relativity, that time is not a constant, that time changes where the speed of light is really the only constant. Um, as people really began delving into that, it really became, uh, it, it changed our whole way of looking at the, the universe. Um, there was a, a speech uh, given in honor of Einstein, and it talked about how uh, these concepts of matter and so on lasted so many hundreds of years and so on when, when they were developed. Uh, and then Einstein came along and again threw them through them for a loop, uh, <laughs> much more, uh, yeah, through them for a loop in terms of the, uh, the effects of it. General relativity is, uh, 
means the acceleration is not equal to zero. So we're accelerating frames of reference, much more complicated. And you can think of this in terms of you're in the car, we're traveling, and you have the ball bouncing going up and going down, going up and going down in your hand. But then your car goes around the corner. Well, the ball is no longer going to go up and come back down again because it's going to want to continue going in the same path of, uh, of how it was traveling. And so general relativity is much more complicated. The much more complicated uh, in terms of the math and so on that was required to do this. In fact, Einstein had to get a mathematician to help him out with working out the math for general relativity. One of the tenets of one of the outcomes of general relativity is that light is bent by gravity. Which really sounds kind of weird, but general relativity really stated that um, an accelerating frame of reference uh, cannot uh, it's going to be the same as a gravitational frame of reference. That you can't tell the difference between an accelerating frame of reference and a gravity frame of reference. Um, so sort of think of this, you know, in space, <coughs> uh, we think of satellites in free fall, that there is no gravity and everyone's just floating around. And so in the science fiction, things, they start the spacecraft spinning and different things like that to give the simulation of gravity. So let's consider a situation of an elevator. Yeah, an elevator. And you've got an elevator. Like an elevator has no windows into it, so you can't look out. So you can't look out and say, oh, I'm moving, or no, I'm not moving. And so you can think of the, the if the elevator's on Earth, then there's gravity. And so if you have a weight and drop it, you know it's going to drop down and it's going to drop like at 9.8 meters per second squared. But if we take this elevator and we're accelerating it upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared, then if we take that rock and release it, the elevator is going to move up and capture the rock at a rate of 9.8 meters per second. So gravity and acceleration, we can't tell the difference. If you're in here, in this uh, elevator, you can't tell whether the elevator is coming up to capture the rock or whether the rock is dropping down and hitting the floor of the elevator. And so when it comes to light, sort of the idea, let's just do a face on here more. Here's our elevator, and what we've done is that we've poked a hole in our elevator. And what we have is that we have a laser on the outside, and that laser is shooting light through that hole. Now, if the elevator wasn't accelerating or moving or anything like that, then we would see the light laser come through and it would hit the opposite wall on the other side. No problem. But now what we're doing is that we're taking the elevator and we're accelerating it upwards. And so when the light comes in through this hole, the elevator is no longer going to be in the same location. The floor of the elevator is going to be moving up. And so when the laser light comes through, it's going to be hitting a point lower down. It's going to follow a path that looks like that. And that's because the elevator is accelerating upwards. The dot will be lower. Now, if we cannot, if, I, if it's true that Einstein says that we cannot distinguish between gravity and an accelerating frame of reference, then if that's true, and this is coming through here, then gravity will direct light. Gravity will bend light. Now, we don't often see that. It's not like we're looking outside and we see light being bent, you know, as it goes across the earth and so on. So how would you ever do this? Well, during a solar eclipse, the sun is blocked out by the moon. And if you ever have opportunity to be close to seeing one, go and see it in 
2017 when my sons and I went down to uh, uh, Oregon to get into the path of the totality and it was truly amazing. So anyways, there was a solar complete eclipse and they were taking a look at a star and the So they would have, well, what happened is that the, the star had a position and then had an apparent position because the light as it's coming past the sun was getting bent. And so the gravity of the sun bent the light. You need something very massive in order to see the effects of gravity bending light, but it's out there. And now we've seen, as we look into space, uh, gravitational lensing, where you have a, like a, a solar system, well, not a solar system, but a galaxy and light coming from behind the galaxy and is being bent. And so if we have something a very strong source there, we'll see light above, we'll see light below and to the left and to the right of things that are actually below, behind this large gravitational source. And so there is you know, a lot of uh, real life data that reinforces this thing. One last thing I just want to talk about, and that's GPSs, Global Positioning Systems. And GPS is what you've got. You've got satellites out in space, and the satellites out in space are constantly sending out these signals. And basically, uh, they're sending out time signals. And so if you've got your little GPS or your, your cell phone, what it does, it compares the signals from uh, these two satellites and notes the differences between them and says, I'm here. <laughs> it can calculate where it is. And that's in, you know, three dimensions, left and right and up and down uh, where you are. And it's very, very accurate. But in order for an in <laughs> so with a GPS, you can my understanding it is possible to have an accuracy of approximately one meter so the satellites or the device can calculate where it is on the face of the earth within one meter and that's extremely kind of crazy but for that to work you need very accurate clocks well that's docks clocks there we go very accurate clocks to be sending out these signals well they can create timepieces that are quite accurate using oh gears and springs and, uh, and pendulums. They have very accurate clocks, but they have to be set. Well, special relativity states that when you have something moving fast, and for something to be in orbit, it has to be moving quickly, time slows. So the designers of the clocks in order to work GPSs, they had to speed up time. So that when the clock was moving quickly, time would slow down to the proper time and be sending out the signal appropriately. Well, the funny thing is, is that in general relativity, uh, low gravity uh, meant faster clocks. So they would have to take their clocks and they have to slow them down in order to meet the uh, the effects of general relativity because they're moving in a circle and so within gravity and so on there's accelerations going on so these are true so when we have gps satellites they're working with both special and general relativity sending out signals so that you know exactly where you are but it's uh yeah it's just an application of what we've been talking about in terms of relativity well ladies and gentlemen i must say this is the the end uh, I have in so many ways, eh? Uh, today I've got 11 school days left before I'm retired. So this is the end. This is the end of uh, Physics 11. And uh, I, yeah, I've enjoyed teaching you guys uh, these past four years. And I wish you all the best in grade 12. And, uh, you know, grad 2021. There we go. Looking forward to uh, coming out and seeing you guys as you cross the stage. So, 
have a great summer. Uh, you've got marks are going in next Thursday, the 18th of uh, June. That's when I have to have my marks into the computer and so on. So, you know, you should be thinking by the 16th, 17th, if you've got things that are outstanding, uh, things that uh, your quizzes and so on you have to work through, get on those, uh, ask for help, come by the school. There we go, ask for help. Come by the school. Uh, things are much easier at the school to come in. We just have to inform the office and come in. You can spend some time in a classroom. We can go over things. I don't mind doing that at all and get you caught up and all ready to go. But uh, let's make this good. Check Jupiter. I'm going to don't be stupider. Check your Jupiter. Uh, we're going to be uh, trying to get that updated pretty quick. That's been not too bad. There's just a couple things. And uh, no more quizzes. That's it. Hey, thanks for watching. It's been a blast. Now just to turn this off. Stop recording now.